Okay, uh, it is a pleasure to give my talk at the P99 conference. Uh, the title of my talk will be How to Scale Apache Pulsar to 10 petabytes per day. Uh, my name is Karthik and uh, I am a Senior Director of Engineering at Splunk, managing the Apache Pulsar team. So before joining Splunk, I was a CEO of a company called Streamlio that got acquired by Splunk. Uh, before creating Streamlio, I was running the streaming division of uh, Twitter, where we developed uh, Apache Heron, the streaming engines. And I have a PhD at uh, from University of Wisconsin-Madison, focused on large-scale data processing. And there will be some forward-looking uh, statements from a legal perspective that uh, uh, disclaimers that you would like to put forward. So that uh, agenda for the talk will be, I'll give some introduction to DSP, the Splunk product, and then what are the requirements and use cases and uh, how we did end up deploying for 10 petabytes. Then how did we make the cluster estimation uh, size estimation and uh, how did we make the optimizations and followed by some conclusions. So Splunk DSP is a product that uh, Splunk uh, uh, markets and it is the steam processing engine for, from Splunk uh, that collects, process and delivers data to Splunk and uh, other destination in milliseconds. You can have a myriad of data sources uh, and Splunk uh, DSP can do some kind of uh, filtering, enhancements, normalization, masking fields, all kind of operations on top of the data that is in motion, uh, then uh, send the data to the appropriate destination that could include Splunk data warehouse, storage, public cloud, S3, and other various type of destinations. So if you zoom in on the DSP, um, the data gets through through either uh, through the REST client or some kind of a universal forward as the talk is Splunk to Splunk protocol, which we call as S2S. Um, then there are some batch sources which can inject data into the Splunk DSP. And uh, Splunk DSP, the first um, uh, ent uh, entity that is uh, receiving the data is called Apache Pulsar, which is actually the uh, next generation pub sub system that was open sourced by Yahoo. Um, and that buffers the data uh, when the data is being ingested via these protocols. Then uh, Pulsar stores the data and buffers it then uh, Apache Flink, which is the stream processing engine, takes the data from Pulsar and processes it based on uh, uh, instructions provided by the user and sends the data to Splunk indexer or external systems. So Apache Pulsar is at the core of the DSP. So what are the customer requirements and deployment? So your market customer is in finance and payments and they use DSP to uh, process the microservices and uh, application logs. So logs contain rich information and these logs have to be processed and we need to extract monitoring and tracing information out of that and uh, filter these logs depending on uh, log volume and if there is any high value justifying how much uh, time to retain it and also compute real-time business metrics based on how the site is performing. So some of the data requirements includes uh, it should be running on the uh, Google Data, uh, Google Cloud platform and use of uh, N1 standard 32 VMs. And the raw data ingestion is 10 petabytes per day that translates approximately into 120 gigabytes per second. Uh, retention of the data is around three hours and the need to handle the entire traffic even when a node zone, when a zone failure occurs in the cloud. So the DSP is deployed in a different way within the customer. So it's essentially the ingestion is separated from the compute clusters. So data ingested from the log publishers are directly published to one cluster uh, DSP ingest cluster, which runs only Pulsar. And the DSP compute cluster are running essentially the pipelines, uh, the Flink pipelines essentially, takes the data from uh, Apache Pulsar cluster and uh, runs through the, crunches the data in the individual pipelines and write it to Splunk Enterprise or Splunk Observability. So essentially this gives advantage of separation of ingestion and compute, which means we can manage those clusters separately and also gives an opportunity for pipeline to isolate each other 
and uh, hence no noi noisy neighbor issues and troubleshooting a single pipeline gets uh, easier uh, uh, because of the no noise noisy neighbor issues uh, you know we might not need to over provision except for a peak load and uh, some fudge factor for spikes so the vm configuration nodes on top of which these tsp clusters are running is uh, n1 standard 32 which consists of 32 vcpus 120 gb of memory maximum number of uh, persistent disks or the ebs equivalent volumes can be 128 uh, max total persistent disk size is 257 terabytes and max ingress uh, egress total network bandwidth is uh, 32 gigabytes per second which amounts to 4 gigabytes per second and maximum you can attach 24 local ssds for a total of 9 terabytes so there are multiple storage options in gcp we will evaluate e again the 10 petabyte performance scaling uh, with respect to each one of the storage types one is phtdd means persistent hard disk actually then pssd is uh, persistent ssds which means Google manages those disks and you can replicate it or they automatically replicate. And local SSDs means essentially the data is ephemeral. If the DM goes down, the data is lost. Initial estimation. So Apache Pulsar requirements in the presence of data is replica factor of three. And need to handle 120 gigabytes of raw traffic. And also need to handle 360 gigabytes of storage write traffic because of the replication factor. And with the journal, if you enable an Apache Pulsar, that doubles because journal also takes the entire brunt of the data traffic, which uh, falls down to 720 gigabytes per second. And the total storage required for retention is around close to 4 petabytes because of 3 hour retention. And the total ingress network bandwidth for the whole data flow is required is 480 Gbps gigabytes per second and total egress network bandwidth required in order to take into advantage of replications and other various other things is 1.2 thousand 1200 gbps so this estimating the pulsar cluster consists of three dimensions one is uh, the ability to uh, absorb the required uh, retention which means uh, how much density of storage you can get per node then the second dimension is storage bandwidth, how much aggregate write throughput and read throughput needed for uh, data ingestion and consumption. It depends on uh, the media itself, because HDD might give a lower performance than SSDs, but uh, local SSDs give the highest performance. And the network bandwidth, aggregate uh, network bandwidth needed on the overall number of nodes. So essentially, like depending upon watch dimension induces the largest amount of nodes that will dictate the size of the cluster. So um, now let us estimate using uh, PHTDs. So here uh, we max the PHTDs give a maximum of 200 megabytes uh, write throughput per VM. Again, this is the right spot what we have observed in pulsar performance. And um, and the storage density maximum of nine terabyte per instance because uh, uh, local SSDs can do at the max nine terabyte. So, um, so if you look at uh, uh, the throughput, the storage bandwidth throughput per VM, you need three three thousand six hundred eighty six VMs in order to manage that uh, ten petabytes per day with journal. Then, uh, when you look at the storage density, it's four hundred forty four nodes. Similarly, if you use the network bandwidth in order to calculate the number of nodes, it is 300. So, which means the whole solution using PHTD requires uh, 3686 because you have to take the largest of all three, and which means it's dominated by storage bandwidth. Similarly, in the PSSD case, if you analyze that, it gets uh, 400 megabytes per second, which means half the number of nodes with PSSDs. Of course, PSSDs are going to be more expensive. Uh, then the storage density is 444, um, network bandwidth also is 300 because the these numbers did not change because they are using the same EMs and the storage density is still the 9 terabytes per instance which you can store on uh, the PSSDs because there is no limitations in terms of the size wise. 
on the other hand if you take local ssds because of the fact local ssds are uh, provide the maximum performance you get to 868 nodes because they give around 850 megabytes write throughput per second and a maximum of 9 terabyte per instance and also maximum of 4 gbp is uh, egress and ingress bandwidth uh, it comes to 120 um, because of the fact when we write the data into local SSDs, the data does not go out of the network. Okay, so that's why the network bandwidth is so low. But even then, it's dominated by the storage bandwidth. Now, so which means in the final and the VMs with the journal approach, uh, PSSD gives 3686. PSSD gives half of it. Local SSD is even further off, uh, uh, half of it, right? So which means local SSD is the winner in this case. Now let us look at what are the optimization that we can apply. First is eliminating journal. Pulsar provides multiple type of uh, durability. One is uh, persistent durability, no data loss in the presence of node failures or entire cluster failure. Replicated durability means no data loss in the presence of limited nodes failures, which means uh, the data is cached on the other nodes and even one node goes down the other nodes will have a copy of it so we can use that copy to retrieve the new node or readjust the replica factor or you could uh, use that uh, copy itself to serve the data then the third one is transient durability data loss in the presence of failures uh, since all the data is in machine logs we use the replicated durability, which means we eliminate the journal. So that means we can eliminate one cop, uh, two dual write, dual writes, right? Because one writing to journal. So essentially, that half the nodes for each one of those uh, storage medias, right? So which means like the PhD comes down to one eight four three, and then um, PSSD comes to nine hundred twenty two then uh, local SSDs comes to 444. So that is VMs without journal. Now we also found out some uh, optimization op uh, opportunities. One is uh, the overhead of page cache in container environment is pretty high because the kernel needs to keep track of the usage quota per container for the page cache. This translates into maintaining some additional data structures and lookups. Volder kernel has uh, N power to look up time for getting pages in and out. And when you bypass the cache on the bookkeeper side of things in Pulsar using GNI, uh, we implemented this. And also we have our multiple caches already built in, right? So you don't need extra page cache. So for memory, we have write and read ahead caches. We have better control on what to cache and when to evict and avoid double buffering. The performance of when we did the performance of uh, uh, direct I/O, um, the performance really improved from a storage bandwidth point of view. PhDs give started giving 300 megabytes from 200. Uh, PhD SSD gives 600, and the local SSD has almost doubled from 850 megabytes per second to 1.6 gigabytes per second. So based on the direct I.O. implementation, if we estimate the number of VMs needed, uh, so the PHTD and PSSD improved to less number of nodes, 128,228 for PHTD, whereas uh, PSSD is uh, 640 nodes. But the local SSD does not change because it's more dominated by storage density. The use of compression um, because we found out the data that is being ingested into Pulsar is extremely compressible to 4 to 5x. So if I do the compress at the, the producer itself, then the consumer can decompress, right? So if you compress the data 4 to 5x, how much uh, optimization you can have? So it reduces the amount of bandwidth that you have to do to 90 Gbps per second. And uh, which means the total storage required for retention is also reduces from 4 petabytes to 975 terabytes. That reduces the storage density. Uh, total ingress network bandwidth also reduces from 4x. 
480 to 120 and also the egress network bandwidth also drastically reduces to 240 gigabytes per second from 1.200 kb gigabytes per second. So once you do compression, the nodes go down dramatically. So 308 in the case of PhD and 154 in the case of PSSD, a local SSD still wins because of, even though it's dominated by storage density, one fourth the compression gives you 111 nodes, which is still pretty good. Now, since one of the thing is uh, we need to continue to ingest data from the Apache Pulsar when we zone failures on, uh, on the cloud. So essentially that means like uh, if a zone failures, the two zones should take the entire traffic. So Pulsar provides a bookie story uh, rack awareness and brokers replicate data to different racks and zones. In the presence of a zone or a rack failure, data is available on other zones so that you can use that data con um, without any interruptions. So one zone failure means two zones should take be capable of handling the entire traffic, requires 50% additional VMs. So if you add the 50% overhead in terms of the nodes, so PHDD again goes to 616, PSSDG goes to 305 or 308, and uh, local SSDs use 220 nodes. And uh, so we also, as an optimization for, we also did some C++ client CPU and memory usage uh, in terms of uh, uh, making the publishers uh, compress the data and also use, use less memory. Um, these fixes have been uh, already committed to open source and it's uh, available for the, uh, anybody who adopts in Pulsar. Finally, uh, we are running the entire setup to handle 10 terabytes for, uh, with 200 N1 standard 32 VMs uh, with the 24 local SSDs per VM. And uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, thanks for listening.